Welcome to the Broad Institute Genomics Platform. I'm Stacey Gabriel, the director of the platform. In March of 2020, we answered a call to help expand the amount of COVID diagnostic testing that was being done locally. Although we have run a licensed clinical lab doing DNA sequencing for several years, viral diagnostics is not something we had done before. Over a short amount of time, we were able to adapt our existing instruments, such as automated liquid handling and PCR machines to perform this test. By the end of March, we were performing hundreds of tests per day, which scaled to thousands of tests per day. And within a six month period, we reached a capacity of over 100,000 COVID tests daily. Our test is a PCR diagnostic test. It has these basic components. First, samples are received and their barcodes are checked to be sure it matches information on the order in our system. Second, liquid containing the cells from the patient sample is transferred from the collection tube into a plate that we can work with. Third is the molecular biology. The nucleic acid, that's the RNA, is extracted from the cells. The last step is detection of the virus. This is done by running the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. This amplifies the material, and if the virus is present, a signal is detected on the instrument. So we were able to reach a really high scale because we designed around some of the known problems other labs experienced. Most labs depend on closed systems that use very specific kits. When the kits are in short supply, testing slows down or stops. Other labs also receive many different types of samples and depend on manual processes. But our approach is really different. The automation we use is all modular so that each step can be optimized and scaled efficiently. We also supply a very standardized collection tube and swab for each one of our tests. This tube and swab work well with our automation. Also, our testing consumables, the reagents, are purchased in bulk. Our aim was to really keep this process as unconstrained on the lab side as possible. And this is what Sheila Dodge will show you as she takes you through the lab next. So when this all first started, we were basically a sequencing laboratory. So these were the only two machines that would detect COVID virus that we had. And this is really the, where it all started. So we moved from these first two machines to then expanding our capacity to a very large number of machines that could do hundreds of thousands of samples a day uh, on these machines. And this allows us to enable testing in underserved populations, in colleges and universities, uh, in nursing homes, skilled nursing homes, in all different types of settings uh, that allow people to get really fast turnaround COVID testing done and uh, enables us to find and contain outbreaks fast before they get too big. This lab is where we actually send out kits. And so this is where uh, all of the swabs and the tubes and the necessary materials for collection sites come together. We're sending to hundreds of groups a day, hundreds of thousands of tubes and swabs go out every day. Uh, and those sites get everything they need to do the COVID testing from us. We have some samples showing up now. Uh, we have some sample drop-off. We allow sample drop-offs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right through these front doors. We have couriers coming um, from all over New England that are dropping off samples um, from hundreds of sites. Uh, right now, we're doing lots of college testing. So these samples will come upstairs, go through these doors here, and into the COVID testing lab. The first step here is receipt and accessioning. To talk a little bit about kind of what this process is and to get those tubes out of the boxes and ready to go into the lab, we have Emily here with us today. Uh, Emily is one of our general supervisors that helps manage this part of the, uh, the lab here. As soon as samples come in the door, we do a intake and receipt process on them, which is basically making sure that the samples came from a site that we expected. Uh, that they weren't damaged in transit, that the samples didn't spill out of their boxes when they were coming into us to make sure that all the samples were transited across the country or between states in a safe way. When a shipment comes in, we associate each shipment with this crisp barcode. So anytime um, 
a sample gets through an accessioning process, they are linked to this. That way, uh, later on in the process, if we ever are wondering how many samples came in with the shipment or where a shipment came from, the date or time it was received, we're able to look up this barcode and then figure out all the samples that were linked underneath it. The next step of the process is doing a um, inspection of the package where they count all the samples that were in the box to make sure that the number of samples in that shipment matches the manifest that we have. And then they go through and then methodically double check all of the PHI, including the patient's name, date of birth, and the sample ID numbers on each of the tubes. And then once they've confirmed each of the samples, they'll go into two different, one of two areas. Um, they'll either go into one of these blue racks, which indicates that the sample has gone through the accessioning process, or they'll be placed into a black Hamilton carrier. Um, and that is one of the pieces that we use in the next downstream part of the process. So a third place that the sample can end up is in one of these orange racks, which indicates that there's been some sort of problem with the sample or that it wasn't found informatically in our system and that we need to get in touch with a PM or a site in order to get some more information to get the sample ready to go downstream. Once the samples have been loaded into the Hamilton carriers, they get put onto these carts that get put into another part of our first in, first out pull system. So once a cart is filled, we move it to the front of this pull section, which is this green tape along the floor, and this cart is ready to go downstream the process. And then the other really important part of accessioning, which is caught before these samples are even put on these racks, is to make sure that all the samples that are coming in the door are prepared in the way that we need them to be. So that means that it's the labels that we've pre-approved, the swabs that we know, it's the tubes that we validated, because in order to get 100,000 samples through the door every single day, we need to make sure that everything is set up exactly the way that we asked for it. Um, otherwise, we run into issues downstream, which will slow down a patient getting their results. Thanks, Emily. So the next part of the process is for us to take the tubes into the first automated section of the lab. And in this section here, we have Tammy Mason, who's actually the manager of the entire laboratory process here uh, for the COVID-19 testing, that's gonna take us through what happens to those tubes once they've been accessioned. So the first step after accessioning is decapping. So we've implemented a high scale decapping machine. It decaps at a rate of 1200 samples per hour um, and it is continuously filled with more samples and as they are uncapped, they go on to the next workflow. When we first started, um, we were still working on how we were going to automate at such a large scale. Um, I remember our first pilot, we were decapping all of our samples by hand and that was a very small pilot and that, was, that took quite a long time. Um, now we can do things at a much, much higher scale. Um, everything is automated. We have systems in place, we have workflows in place, and we have the people in place, most importantly. Um, we have automation teams on site to help us maintain our automation and keep us at a high capacity. Um, this is our tube filler. Um, this tube filler is filling a set of eight carriers, 188 samples, um, with a lysis buffer that inactivates the virus. Um, once this buffer is added, the samples are now inert and are much more safe to use. So once the samples are filled um, with the lysis buffer, they go onto the shaker. Um, the shaker will run for 15 minutes. And what this is doing is taking the cells from the swab into the liquid. So the tubes are transferred from the shakers onto these Hamilton starlets. Um, the Hamilton starlet is an automated robot. Um, it's only function is to transfer liquid from one place to another and we use it at a very high capacity in order to transfer the liquid from the sample swab tubes into a 96 well plate which is something that we can use um, much more easily throughout our process. And what about um, is special about these automation systems in terms of like if the swabs have any issues or anything like that can you talk about that? Every sample that we have that's coming into this process is barcoded um, as you've seen during accessioning. We use that barcode to track the sample through the lab. So every time that sample is moved, touched by a person, um, we record when, where, who, and how, everything that's happened to it so far. Once the samples are complete on the Hamilton, they output a plate. Um, this plate now contains 94 samples and two controls. And it's barcoded so that we can track this plate through the lab. So just like the visual cues on the floor, of the yellow tape and the green tape, we've got the same sort of setup here to, to manage that flow of samples through the lab. Once the plates are now in this format, they're ready for the next step of the process, which is as we move through um, to extracting the RNA material. So I'm going to have Brendan 
uh, who's actually uh, been the leader that's developed a lot of the process that you've seen here today, um, talk us through kind of what the next steps of this are and take us into the extraction and, and QPCR room. Okay, Brennan, what's happening in this area? Okay, so throughout the process that you've seen so far, the samples have been reduced in their footprint more and more and more. And what came out of transfers are these 96 well plates holding 96 actual clinical samples. At this step, four of those 96 well plates are now being consolidated further into a single 384 well plate. It's in that plate that the actual RNA will be extracted from the sample. In a lot of cases here, we've had to actually custom manufacture parts to do things like this plate piercing, which is actually holding the plate down. So we have a fabrication shop in-house also where we make parts to actually serve certain purposes in our process. So one of the things to point out is that there's a lot of different methods for actually extracting RNA from a clinical sample. And when we designed this process, we realized that we needed a, a, a method that was very automatable. And because we have so much automation experience from all of our genomics work in this building, we realized that there were certain kits that worked better with our automation than others. We settled on this one particular kit, and the way it works is the RNA is bound to these small magnetic beads. The beads are then pulled down onto a magnet, and the residual cellular material or sample from the swab is washed away. A couple subsequent washes then clean that RNA further, and then that clean RNA is eluded off those beads into, into a, the sample that we'll then take onto qPCR. And so basically this step right here, we're going from the swab, yep. we're adding lysis buffer to sort of inactivate the virus and take off the cells, and then in this step here, you're essentially pulling the RNA down so that you can go and assess that RNA to see whether or not it's got any viral That's right. molecules in it. Okay, so at this step, that clean extracted RNA is now being transferred into a plate that already contains the master mix for the RT-QPCR reaction. Um, it's at this step that everything's ready to go onto our detection systems that will then actually detect the signal as to whether some individual has COVID or not. So this is the critical step because all this processing up front that you've seen so far is just to get the actual sample to a point where the signal can be detected. Then we, we move them to the detection instruments, which are out around the corner. And so here in the detection lab is where we're, you know, looking for whether or not each sample actually has viral molecules in it. And so these machines here are detection machines. These are Quant Studios um, that allow us to look in real time at when certain molecules start to amplify in these particular samples. So this is where the actual COVID RNA is detected. If a clinical sample has COVID present, fragments of that RNA are transcribed into DNA. And then as this machine heats and cools cycle after cycle, it doubles every cycle the number of fragments of the COVID transcribed DNA. If somebody has a lot of copies and has a high viral load, you'll get a signal pretty early in the process. But because this test is so sensitive, even a sample that has a handful of copies, maybe 50 copies, you'll end up getting signal, but it'll be later in the process. And that's what this machine is doing. Cycle after cycle, it's measuring the intensity of the fluorescence of that individual sample. And then what it does is it plots it on this curve. And by looking at the curve, you can actually see whether somebody had amplifiable COVID RNA in their, on their swab. And so what happens after this is once we've reviewed this data and we're confident that we know that the sample is positive or negative, then we have our resulting software um, sort of pick that information up, we process it, and then we result back out to all the sites. So whether that's you know, directly to the participants themselves, which is most of the sites, or to their physician um, or the ordering physician that um, actually ordered the test from us and sent the tubes to us. And so they will be able to look at that and get a report, a clinical report, that basically says they're positive or negative for COVID-19. And then if they're positive, obviously there's follow-up that's gonna happen in terms of the clinical care for that patient, um, as well as contact tracing with the state. And so we report out to all of the states um, that we've received samples from so that they can do the proper contact tracing and make sure they're following where those positives might be coming from. 
So I want to thank you for joining us on this tour today of our COVID-19 testing facility here at the Broad. If you want to watch our progress about how many tests we're doing and what our positive rate is um, in the communities that we're testing, you can go to broad.io slash testing and you can see our dashboard there that gives you a little bit more information and real-time data on the COVID testing that we're doing. Thank you.